English class, um, which is like a lower level class, or an upper level class called Honors English. Um, so that in education is called tracking. Um, and tracking can be is a complicated thing and problematic in some ways um, because it's often stratified along racial and economic lines. Um, and so what Cambridge was seeing um, at their school was that um, students from who were black and brown or from low income families would end up in the college prep level classes, um, and students who were white or from upper class backgrounds um, with some variability would end up in the honors track classes. Cambridge recognized this as an issue um, and decided to detract their classes. And so the result of this was that in my classroom, all of a sudden, all of the kids were strangers to each other, right? They grew up with, in like neighborhood schools that were super homogenous, and then they came to their classes, their classes were detracted, they weren't with people from their neighborhood anymore. Um, and so my 10th grade class, um, all of the 10th grade classes, were basically in their second year of integration. Um, and I noticed that a number of my students um, who held more marginalized identities were participating less in class. Um, and when I had this conversation with one of my students about how he didn't know another kid after four months of class together, I thought, how can I really expect meaningful participation from my students, especially students who may feel marginalized in the classroom, when they don't know each other. They don't know each other's names, they don't care about each other, and, and they don't feel supported by each other. I could not possibly reasonably expect them to participate in class. Um, and so I wrote an unwieldy research question. Um, I am an English teacher um, that is in two pieces. The first piece is, how can I build a classroom community in which all students know each other by name and have a genuine interest in each other? They have a genuine respect for each other. And then, because that wasn't going to be enough, I thought, what impact is this going to have on classroom discussions? Is getting students to care about each other going to help them participate more meaningfully um, or just more in class? So I had interventions uh, in two pieces. Um, and the first piece um, was based on, on this idea of students feeling comfortable around each other and thinking that that would support their participation. Um, and so I did this in a number of ways. We played a lot of name games. Um, we did some sociometry, which is where like people get up and they stand on one side of the room or the other based on how they identify or what they like to eat for breakfast. And um, I even used these bizarre getting to know you cards that my mentor teacher had from the 90s where students work together in pairs talking to each other. Um, and it works. So um, I have a meme here uh, that really represents um, an experience I had after students got to know each other well. <laughs> so we started, out, um, we started out with class being extremely easy to manage, um, right? They were super quiet because they didn't talk to each other, because they didn't know each other. Um, and that made our class discussions sparse, but it also made our transitions quick. Um, and after we got to know each other and students liked each other and enjoyed each other's company, um, they learned each other's names and they became extremely difficult to manage, right? They uh, <laughs> were having such a good time. They were so, so chatty. And um, getting people to move from one uh, activity to the other um, became quite di difficult. Um, and so here, yeah, this is an image of you waiting for it to be quiet. Um, yeah, it took a really long time. So, okay, so that's cool. So let's return to this research question. My first piece, how can I build a classroom community in which all students know each other by name and they have a genuine interest in and respect for each other? We can do that by doing name games and pairing people up and making sure they talk to each other and making sure they know a little bit about one another. We can do that. And was I noticing that this helped class discussion like at all? Um, yeah, it, it didn't. It really didn't. Right? Um, so, uh, people were super chatty, and then when I asked them, okay, so what did you notice in this poem that we just read? Silence. Or the same people participating as before. So, um, that's when phase two of the interventions came. Um, I realized that um, community building work in the classroom, if I hoped 
for it to change the way our class um, participated in discussion and actually built in meaningful ways on each other's knowledge. Um, I needed to orient our community building towards collegiality, right? So that students needed to have their community building as part of the content of the course. They needed it to be um, academic because, as it turns out, just because you're friends doesn't mean that you know how to interact and in an academic context. Um, it doesn't make you comfortable talking about your ideas. So we shifted. I shifted gears um, and worked on changing our community context to one that was more academic. I did this in a few ways. Um, we, I designed a unit um, that was called the American Teenager Project. It's part of a national um, photojournalism-inspired, uh, how would I describe this? Photojournalism-inspired um, like narrative unit. Um, and that involves students interviewing each other and writing profiles about each other so they could learn about writing personal narratives, learn about profiling each other, learn about interviewing and pre-drafting, um, and really honor each other by talking about who their peers were, but doing that in an academic context, using their English skills to do so and honoring their peers by using their English skills to talk about them. Um, Similarly, we did work in literature circles where students were working in small groups. Um, students had really structured partner work. Um, so they would write a poem and then actually analyze each other's poems as though they were written by real authors, because our students are real authors, right? Um, and we also worked on deep listening and talk moves, um, something Chelsea might get into a little bit in her presentation, um, in which students uh, were learning how can I actually ask someone about their thinking, right? How can I actually listen to someone meaningfully? How can I build on what someone said instead of just kind of sharing my idea and then another person shares their idea and those ideas don't interact or support each other? So we worked explicitly in many different ways on building our community into a collegial one, an academic one, beyond just a social one. So I should have mentioned before this that um, I did some research, this is a research project, um, I, did, I uh, had a couple of different ways of measuring the changes in our class um, and uh, seeing kind of where the shifts happened in terms of our community socially and um, academically. Uh, and the one I'm going to speak about most today was a survey. Um, students took a pre-survey and a post-survey, so about a month in, this was a little bit after we had done our name games, but not too deep into the name games. Um, they had a survey, and then they took one at the very end of my time teaching there. Um, this is the one about students' names. I think we've covered this. Most students learned 100% of their peers' names um, in the first month. Um, but this, this is kind of our more meaningful stuff. So um, this is a survey, um, or this question is, asking students to respond um, always, sometimes, or never to, I think my class, classmates listen to me during whole class discussions. Um, there's a pretty significant shift. Um, nobody said never, which even at the beginning, which is a nice thing. Um, and <laughs> students who were saying they only sometimes thought their peers were listening to them in class um, was reduced quite a lot uh, to 39% by, uh, by the second survey. Similarly, um, you have the flip side of this. I listen to what my classmates say when we're having full class discussions. Um, we had many more students who said they were always listening in February, but by the end, even more students said they were always listening to each other when they were having whole class discussions. Um, I do want to share that you know, these surveys address the question of listening as a, kind of a respect that students might have for each other. But it doesn't really address the ways that students um, build meaning together in class. And that's kind of a piece of research that um, I try to get out with my next, with my next piece, um, but also is something for my future research. Um, at the end of the survey, um, I had an open response question. Um, that's always an adventure. Sometimes people really go for it. Um, I asked students, 
if you were in a small group and you noticed a group member seemed nervous and they were not participating, what would you do about it? And I got three kind of grouped responses into three varieties. Um, the first group um, is the like emotional support group. So if someone seems nervous, they'll say, um, are, are you okay? Or they might say, I made a joke to make them feel comfortable or <coughs> something like that. Um, the orange group are students who say IDK, right? <laughs> Actually, it's so many responses that said IDK. Um, or, and the last piece is a collegial invitation, which is where students say, um, maybe I asked them what they thought about the reading or I asked them about something they said earlier in class to bring them into the conversation. And at the beginning, there, we see a slight shift. It's not a dramatic shift, but it is a slight one. That um, earlier, when I first took this, fewer students were inviting each other in in a collegial manner by asking, what did you think about this? And we're just kind of leaning more heavily on the emotional support, like, are you okay? Um, later, we had fewer students who were doing nothing um, and more students uh, who are inviting each other into the conversation in a collegial manner. Um, lastly, we tracked student participation um, in class by hand, via hand raises, right? So this is another piece that's kind of quantity of participation um, and doesn't as much deal with whether or not participation is meaningful. Um, but we didn't count people who were like, can I go to the bathroom? Can I go to the bathroom? Right. Um, so, Earlier, when we initially took our data, um, five students were, of 18 students were only participating consistently in class. Um, and we got, we added a few more students um, by the end. So, what do I take away from this, right? This is a survey of 18 kids. One student really moves the percentage pretty far over. Um, and, as we said, uh, and as Shanae mentioned, um, teacher research is about individuals, right? So I offer these pie graphs to you, knowing that really this is about seeing if we can get one more or two more kids to feel comfortable in the classroom, like that is meaningful enough to me. It is more meaningful even than the moving my percentage over slightly in my pie chart. Um, <coughs> I just want to address, I'm running out of time, but the second piece of this question, what impact, if any, is cultivating this community of people who care about each other having on classroom discussions? It's kind of, it's kind of doing that, right, is the answer. Um, it is making students demonstrate more, slightly more engagement. Um, they look physically more engaged. They seem happier to be in the classroom space and some students are participating more by the end of the class um, than they were at the beginning. Um, my general takeaways and learnings from this process are that community really matters in the classroom. Um, and the type of community that you are building in the classroom is what matters most. It is um, crucial for students to care about each other or at least respect each other and have some interest in each other. Um, but also you cannot expect that because students know each other socially and like each other, that they'll be able to engage with each other in a meaningful way in a classroom. Um, you need to offer students the tools to build a collegial community um, beyond offering them a name game, right? So you need both of those two pieces. I think next year um, what I will do is incorporate both of those, but work harder um, and be more explicit at the outset about how to um, support students in conversation with each other um, and in academic engagement in the classroom together. Um, thank you so much for listening. Um, and yeah, I guess we'll do questions on that. Classroom, and I'll explain a little bit more what I mean by that. 
So just for a little bit of context, my placement was at Framingham High School and I was there for the whole year. So I was there as well. I did a what we call a mini placement to work with English language learner students, um, but I stayed at Framingham. And so um, by the spring semester, I was working in a bunch of different classrooms. But for this research, I'm focusing mostly on my 9th and 10th grade biology classes, which were at the college prep and advanced college prep levels, which are like the lower two levels at Framingham. Um, so student demographics at Framingham, very diverse, um, both social, socially, economically, um, racially. There is, the school is majority white, but a lot of that white is actually um, Portuguese, um, Portuguese speakers from Brazil, uh, which are counted on the census as being white. And so we have a lot of immigrant students at Framingham. And so that was one of my considerations as well in my classroom. And so some other considerations, the biology MCAS. And so the MCAS, for those of you who are not from Massachusetts, is like our big state test in a various, um, very variety of subjects. So there's the ELA MCAS, there's the math MCAS, and there's also a science MCAS. And you need to pass all three of those in order to graduate from high school. And so that was a major consideration for me to try to get my students at the end of the year prepared to take the biology MCAS so that they could hopefully have a high school diploma um, by the end of the four years. I also had a lot of students, especially in my college prep classes, that were on IEPs, which is an individualized education plan. And so this is um, a, this is usually a disability plan of some sort um, for them to have support in the classroom. Okay, so this was my major consideration with the MCAS testing. And so for those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, just think of any terrible, large, standardized exam. <laughs> um, one of them, okay? And so it's, I would say, kind of infamous for really trying to trip students up, not with just the science content, but also with the language. And so I was really worried, you know, about in my students, so they know the science, but are they going to be able to kind of understand the language in the test to be able to do well on it? Because that is something that can really get in the way for a lot of students. And so what I noticed and what kind of drove me to start this research was I was delivering an exam and I took my genetics unit and I have a little bit of a um, exam, student work example there which I'll zoom in on in a little bit. Um, but basically I noticed that my students, you know, I always tell them to show their work and so I was looking at their work and I was like, okay, you get it. But then they weren't answering the question correctly and I was a little bit confused about this and this specific question was really kind of took me aback because only three out of 24 students in my one class answered this correctly, even though as a whole the class did pretty well on this test. And so let me just zoom in on this a little bit. So for those of you who have some biology knowledge, we were talking about Hunnett squares. So this is basically just a way for them to figure out, you know, you know, based on the parents, you know, genes, what how can you predict the offspring. Okay. And so we did a lot of work on this and so the student, you know, they filled it out correctly and everything. But they weren't giving me the answer that I was looking for. And so I'll explain a little bit more why this was a little weird to me. And so here are some explanations that I was trying to come up with. I was like, all right, did they not understand the concept? Well, no, they were showing the work so that I knew that they understood what was going on. Did they not maybe read the question completely, correctly at all? Maybe they made a mistake. Well, 3 out of 24, that's, you know, 21 people making a mistake, that seems kind of improbable. Mm -hmm. uh, or did they maybe not understand the question because of something on my end, I didn't, you know, write it correctly or write it clearly or something like that. Um, but I kind of look at it a little bit more, and um, I'll let you look at this, and you don't need any biology knowledge for me to understand what I'm talking about. But basically, the answer to the question that I was asking was actually written in the question. So I was basically just asking for, you know, like, what's the hair color of this family? And, you know, they did all this work, and they gave me all these ratios, but I've underlined, you know, it tells you in the question what, you know, what I'm looking for. And so that led me to, so led me to think, you know, maybe they're not reading the question completely, you know, they're just skimming over it, they're not taking the time to read things carefully. And that's obviously going to be a problem if you want to do well on a test like the MCAS, which, like I said, is notorious for kind of tripping people up by like hiding things in the question. And so this led me to kind of my overarching question, which is more kind of like student-centered, which is how can I help students develop the literary skills, literacy skills that they need to succeed, right? So not just on the MCAS, but also just in life in general, it is a useful skill to be able to read things accurately, I would say. And so this developed into my more kind of specific research question, which I have here, which is how can implementing strategies for reading comprehension and test taking improve student performance and also motivation? And I'll get to that as kind of like my second part. 
So this is my first intervention that I delivered. And so I was thinking, all right, we're going to go back to this question that really tripped everybody up. We're going to try to walk through it step by step. And so I had the students you know, go back into the question, underline you know, what's the important information, restate the question in their own words, and then try to get to see if you know, that improved their performance at all, like doing those intentional reading steps. And so I would say um, with this one, I saw kind of, you know, some encouraging results. So we went, I think, from 3 out of 24 to 9 out of 24. So we're still not reaching, you know, a majority of the students, but there was some increase, you know, in how they did. One thing that I did notice was when I gave this to the students, they kind of gave me a blank stare. They were like, why are we doing this? You know, I had a lot of students either not do it correctly or they were just like, I don't want to do this. This is stupid. And so I was like, all right, maybe I have to change my method a little bit because students don't seem to want to work on their reading comprehension. <laughs> so I took a little survey just to check in. All right, is this something that they even need? You know, like is, you know, from their end, did they see as this being something that they need help with? And so I asked, you know, first of all, do you always, mostly, sometimes, or never understand what questions on tests are asking me to do? And when you don't understand something, is there something that you can try again, or do you get help? All right, so this was just a small survey to see, you know, what's, like, where, where are they at in terms of their kind of test-taking strategy or ability. And so I highlighted this because six out of my 24 students said that they only sometimes understand what questions we're asking. And I was like, all right, sometimes is not, that's not good enough. We're trying to hit mostly. So that was kind of my encouragement to be like, okay, I can continue. This is something that they kind of need help with, and they, you know, at least subconsciously recognize that. And so with my second intervention, I changed my strategy slightly because, like I said, I was the students didn't seem to really understand why they were doing it. And so with my second intervention, I made explicit why we were doing it. I explained to them, you know, we're doing this because, you know, not only do we have the biology and tests that we have to consider, but also this is, this is something that's going to help you in all areas of your life. And I also modeled how to do the intervention with the students, which is something that I didn't do with the first one. And so by modeling, I mean I kind of walked through one question with them. I was like, all right, let's do this together. What, where's the question? Can you identify it? And I underlined it with them. And then how can we you know, say the question in our own words? And I did that together with them. And so we walked through the whole thing together. And then I kind of set them loose to do several other questions on their own. And this seemed to improve that motivation piece a lot more for the students. They, you know, they were like, oh, like, I see what we're doing this. You know, and they, I could see that they were working without complaining, which, you know, if you know high schoolers, it's a big deal. <laughs> and so I, I saw that being as, you know, successful strategies for at least getting to, to work with these interventions. And so with this second one, all right, I also noticed that they were starting to internalize the strategies a little bit. And so this was a really admittedly terrible picture that I took, but this is another test that we gave um, on evolution. And so I, I noticed the student actually was doing some of those things that I was teaching them to do in my intervention. So I pointed out, you know, he was underlining the question, he was rewriting it in his own words, and then he got the question correct. So that was a nice, small kind of <coughs> micro evidence for this, this working, um, as you could say. And so I delivered a survey as well, again, at the, towards the end of the year, and this was checking in, all right, um, are you guys doing any of these specific things that I've been teaching you? you know, so um, I, had, I asked, you know, when you read a question on test, do you always do you know, X, Y, Z? And so some things like identify important words and phrases, um, you know, rewrite the question in my own words. I was kind of checking to see were there any students who were doing these things. And then also as well, right, when I read the question, I don't understand it, then what's kind of their follow-up strategy for those? And I found that, you know, I had an increase in percentage of strategies that I marked as being, you know, more related towards reading comprehension. And so that was a little bit encouraging um, evidence for the students at least internalizing the strategies that I was teaching. And so here's some more numbers in terms of performance. And so that was one piece of my question was, is it going to improve performance at all? And so this was the first thing that I looked at, was just the specific questions that I was delivering interventions on, because all those questions that I had them kind of go back and do were for, were for previous assessments. And so I, have, I just picked up two questions and I saw, you know, there was a slight increase um, in the proportion of students who were doing this correctly. But of course, you know, it might be that they got to see it again, it might not just be because of the strategy, right? And then in terms of performance, all right, that top graph over there is on a selected test from before and after. And so I had two classes that I was looking at, like I mentioned before. And so I just separated them out. And then as well, I totaled the averages 
how they did. And so you can see one class did a little bit better and the other class actually did a little bit worse. Um, and then in terms of the midterm and the final, which was a, like a good way to look at more standardized performance um, because the midterm and final is standardized across the biology department at Framingham. Um, we had a slight decrease in performance from both classes. But again, the, this could be due to a variety of factors. Um, students typically do worse on the final, and you can imagine um, students, their motivation is not necessarily the best in June. Um, we're, not all, we're not definitely not working as hard as we could be during that time. And so I definitely, you know, in terms of what I can say, statistically, not too much, right? So, you know, wh whether there was an increase or a decrease, none of it was, you know, very statistically significant. So what I focused on more was, okay, the students are using the strategies. And I would say, you know, if I had longer term data, if I were able to overcome this, you know, over maybe seven years and with more classes, that I would feel a lot more confident in being like, all right, this is something that we can say about what I'm doing. And so in terms of major lessons, you know, what I got out of this was that strategies, they need to be modeled so that students know how to use them, right? So the difference between my first and second interventions was that I was showing them how to do it. And so that seemed to help them a lot in terms of like, oh, like, this is how, this is what's expected of us. And then my second lesson was also that they need to be used consistently for them to internalize their practices. And so this is something that I noticed, you know, you know, not just with these interventions that I gave, but also just with any lesson that I delivered in general was that students need to be able to practice things. And that seems like a common sense sort of statement, but I felt like this really drove the point home for me. So in terms of reflection, um, looking back, I, I set up as sort of a series of questions to not only look back, but also to look forward. And so thinking about, you know, as I move on, so my, my placement next year is going to be in a school where I don't have to contend with the MCAS, thank goodness. Um, but the, these things I learned can still be really applicable in a classroom, you know, without the MCAS. Like I said, these are skills that are really essential, regardless of whether you have to take a state exam or not. And I also would be really interested as well to think about um, what types of reading misconceptions that few high school students have? Because in science pedagogy, we talk a lot about you know misconceptions where like people say this and that, you know that is incorrect about science. But I think this is something that you can find in reading as well. Like not only why do you need to read well, but also like you know how to read effectively. I think there can be misconceptions about that. And finally, just how can I integrate these skills? Being a new full-time teacher, you know, I'm moving from being a full-time student to being a full-time teacher. And they always tell me the first couple years of teaching is the hardest. And this is something I learned from my mom, who is also a teacher. <laughs> um, and so how am I going to be able to kind of do these things while I'm, you know, struggling with all the other things I come with being a new teacher? And so I'll leave you with this final question, which is what I would like to work on if I did have, you know, kind of the time and the resources, is to work more on that 